Hello and welcome to the EcomOps podcast. This is another episode and today I'm talking with Ian Bauer from Graphic Rhythm and they are transforming the graphic design service landscape. Hi Ian, great to meet you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are talking so much about e-commerce here and about operations and about technical things. And I really, I'm really happy that we have today here a design topic, uh, not even just design. I mean, we're also talking about owning customers. I'm pretty happy to learn more about that. And Ian, um, tell us a bit more about yourself. What are you doing and how did you land up in the design world um, tied to e-commerce especially? Well, so it's an interesting story. I, I'm not a designer. I'll say that right off the bat. Uh, I don't even have Photoshop installed on my computer, just to give you an idea. <laughs> um, but I was, uh, I still am an Amazon seller. And uh, I still do that. And I manage brands. And I do a bunch of like, you know, selling related stuff on Amazon. And in the course of that, I, you know, naturally, you need graphic designer, you know, if you're going to optimize your listings, if you're going to try and sell more stuff on Amazon, you need to, you know, create gallery images and A plus content storefront. So I always had a staff designer on my team. Um, and I've always been very good at communicating with designers and artists and things like that. And so, um, you know, that's, that's like, sort of the first part of it. And then the second part of it is I, you know, the Amazon community is a very tight knit community. You know, we're, we're all chatting and talking in Facebook groups and Reddit groups and so on and so forth. And so naturally, um, you know, my peers and uh, acquaintances started asking about my designer, like, hey, could I hire her? Could I, you know, could, could you do these designs for me? And that's where this idea of graphic rhythm came around. So we're, uh, I like to tell people we're not a design agency. I didn't start graphic rhythm because uh, I was a designer looking for more work. I started Graphic Rhythm because I was a client looking to improve the experience of working with a designer. So that's kind of what we hang our hat on. And so now we're a design agency. You know, design agency is such a misnomer for us because design is a part of it, right? But you can get design kind of anywhere. The hard part is really the strategy, the copywriting. Like, what do I say? What should this actually look like? And if you go to like Fiverr or something like that, you're going to be responsible for that. But if you come to us, we're going to be responsible. We're going to help you do that. So that's the big idea behind Graphic Rhythm and how we got started. Cool. It's a very, very interesting approach, to be honest, because we know, of course, all these kind of design agencies that really just do what the customer says. Of course, they have strategy. Of course, they have uh, some ideas that bring in. And of course, it looks beautiful. But I think the aspect that you are working is quite different. So... um you, well, what I understood is you are looking to to find the right strategy for a customer, and then you have designers fulfilling your strategy together with the goals that the customer has. Yeah, exactly. When you know a design project has a few different parts, and design is just the last part of it. Yep. You know, you need strategy. Like, what am I trying to do? What should these images accomplish? Right. That's the whole design idea behind graphic design, by the way. Right. Graphic design. Art that sells stuff is graphic design, right? And so what if, if we're not producing something that's going to accomplish a goal, a functional utility for your business, then what are we even doing here? And so what we found in the early days of the business, because we used to just be like a design agency, right? Like, just tell us what you want and we'll make it, but not for very long. I'm talking like weeks, you know, like after our first 10 clients, I was like, I'm all done with this idea. Because what would happen is the client would ask for something and then we would make it and then they would hate it <laughs> because, and they didn't <laughs> hate the design, they hated their idea. And so, but we were on the hook for revising it and improving it, right? And, and you just had all these iterations. And so finally, I started saying to my clients, listen, you just tell me about your product and I'll take care of the rest. How does that sound, right? And then we've never looked back. It's been that way from the beginning and that's, that's our favorite way to work and that's how we do it. Awesome. That's really cool. Um. Why is this so important, especially for Amazon, but also in e-commerce in general? Why is that so important? I mean, I take a picture of a product. Of course, picture needs to be nice and, uh, and you need to, um, uh, uh, blur the background or remove the background and you have different shots and maybe you have a 3D image turning around and video. But why is that so important on, on those channels? 
Yeah, so uh, it's arguably more important on marketplaces than it is on your own e-commerce store. However, I'm always disappointed when I go to a Shopify or a Wix store or something like that. And, uh, all, you know, I click on the product and all I get is photos. There are some products where you could just get away with photos, okay? Low context products where the customer just doesn't need to know a lot in order to buy it. it the easiest thing that comes to my mind is like fashion, apparel, things where yeah. you just, it needs to look right. But if you get even slightly technical with your product, then you have to upgrade the imagery to communicate sales ideas, right? The people, especially now, right? They're, they're visual. They don't want to read. They don't want to look at your bullets off your, on your Amazon listing. They don't want to get into it. They want to like look at the pictures and get all of the answers to their questions. That's the big idea, by the way. Mm -hmm. You want to answer all of your customers' questions, which are their objections in your imagery. Uh, and if you do that, then you win the customer. If you don't do that, then they go somewhere where they can get their questions answered really quick, right? Uncertainty is really the the obstacle to a sale. If I'm not sure if this diaper bag has the feature that I'm looking for, but this listing specifically does say that it has that feature, I'm going over there. Mm -hmm. So that's the big idea. That's what we're trying to accomplish. Cool. And um, on Amazon, is it allowed to have such descriptions on images, uh, uh, or is it is there any are there any restrictions that you need to take care of when you do these designs? Yeah, the only restriction is on the main image. The main image cannot have any text, uh, and there's some other rules about it. But there are some clever ways of getting around that. Uh, if anybody's curious, one clever way, which you know maybe your listeners are already familiar with, is um, your packaging can appear in the main image. And so with some of our clients, what we do is we um, like design in virtual space their packaging that has marketing messages on it, even if they never actually ship in that packaging. Yeah, uh, and then we put that in the main <laughs> image so that you can get get that click. There are other restrictions, you know, like you can't have reviews on there. You can't make certain claims. You can't. Uh, Amazon's really been cracking down on comparison charts, like uh, disparaging your competitor, even a generalized competitor these days. So there are some things like that, and we help you navigate all of that. Uh, our policy is, is um, you know, we're going to produce compliant images, and if Amazon rejects your images for any reason, then we'll revise them until they accept them. So, yeah. Cool. That's really a nice offer because there can be a lot of work. I understand that. Yeah. Um, what what do you what would you say? What are the the, the the most the three most common mistakes all businesses making regarding design imagery for products? Um, three common mistakes. Well, so the first one is not um, not answering your customers' questions. You know, I already mentioned that, so I won't spend too much time on it. But the, uh, there's a little hack that you could use, by the way. Uh, if you're looking on an Amazon listing, you can go down to the question and answer section, which has become annoying to access these days. They changed it so that instead of listing all the questions, you have to search for a question and it just brings it up. But if you just type all the question words, who, what, where, when, why, how, right? You type that in there, you could start getting lists of all the questions that customers ask before they purchase. So use those to help inform the kind of answers that you're going to give in your, uh, in your gallery images. The second big mistake that I see people make is that um, they, they uh, this is actually a designer mistake. But I, I have a feeling that a lot of brand owners enjoy this mistake. And so they kind of like uh, give into it, which is that uh, your images should be copywriting focused. OK, so the graphic design component should exist only to draw attention to and prioritize the way that the copywriting is on there. So, for instance, if the if the text is really small, then that's a big problem. Um, if the, uh, you know, your call outs are distracting or there's no uh, focal point for an image. That's another big one, right? So it's kind of like your eyes look at it and you don't have anything to focus on. That's a big issue. So examine if you have, uh, you know, optimize your, your images, take a look at that and see if there's, you know, if it's cohesive, if it makes sense, if the design is helping guide the viewer through the sales messaging that you want them to uh, ingest. Um, and then the third mistake I would say is putting your images out of order. I see this all the time. This is such a big problem. 
So imagine the Amazon customer showing up on an Amazon listing. And uh, if they're anything like me, then, you know, they're shopping. I said diaper bags earlier, so we'll stick to that, right? So they're shopping for diaper bags. They've opened like 500 tabs, right? They're looking at a whole bunch of products all at the same time. And uh, they land on your listing. You have their attention for like literally seconds. So don't, um, don't start out with the worst or least interesting feature or benefit of your product. Diaper bags, it's it's less of a, a great example, but for something like food or supplements, a good example is like dropping your nutrition label right in the first image, right? So main image, then the second image is like the nutrition label. Who cares, right? Like we'll get to the nutrition label later. Tell me how this is going to change my life right now. Uh, so just be conscious of that. You want You want the most important messages to show up first in your listing and then the least important messages to show up last. And then that idea carries through down to like the A plus content on an Amazon listing uh, where you want to, um, you know, people who are looking at A plus content are deeper in the funnel now. They're more familiar. You think of yourself as a finalist, right? Uh, you want to give them the things that are going to push them up over the edge. So tell them your brand story. This is a great time to do that. Tell them why they should feel good about this purchase. Uh, answer some final questions that they might have. So uh, what we call is we call that is um, message sequencing. So make sure your messages are sequenced correctly. I really like that you mentioned that uh, two points that you mentioned actually. One is the questions uh, because um, it's not only in e-commerce that this is a good way to understand how which questions the customer asks and the most common one to present them in your story or present them in 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 in, in uh, uh, your 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 answers already you give them the answer before they can ask the question which is very important thing and it's very very common uh, but also the way how to make a story out of the, your graphics because what i've seen on amazon quite a lot is that the a plus content as you said just includes the same imagery as the images that you include in in your uh, carousel um, in, in, in Amazon. And to be honest, if I come to that section, I don't want to see the same images again. How do you see that? Yeah, you've got questions, right? At that point, you're coming down there because there was an unanswered question. And that's fair. You know, some products are, we work with some products that are very technical, just lots of questions to be answered. And you can't get it all in the gallery images. So put it down mm -hmm. in your A-plus content. Like, that's your... That's your space to spread out. You've got some breathing room and really start talking to your customer. Awesome. Cool. Um, how do you see it in, in e-commerce stores? Do we need to have the same images there or um, should this be different images? Yeah, I think that they should be the same images in an e-commerce store because you have the same kind of questions. The only difference between your, your store, your e-commerce store and the Amazon marketplace is often the customer starts in a different place not necessarily. You need to know your customer. With Amazon, the customer is always problem aware, right? So mm -hmm. they're look or they're, and they're looking for solutions. Whereas your e-commerce store, the customers could be um, unaware. They could be problem aware. Um, they're not often solution aware. I don't think it depends. It depends. It's like if you have a returning customer, that's one thing. It depends on your space, but. It's much more variable on your store versus Amazon. And the point, the net result of that is on an Amazon listing, I always advise my clients, don't try and educate your customer. They're not there to learn about why your yoga mat, why they need a yoga mat, right? Like they're not there to learn that, okay? They just want to know why yours is the best yoga mat, okay? On your e-commerce store, they might need to be educated, right? Because they didn't... They, didn't, they weren't on the internet looking for you. Maybe they came in through a Facebook ad. They weren't expecting to show up on your store today, right? And so now you need to now you need to educate them about why they need a yoga mat, right? Like, oh, are you practicing yoga? Well, you can make your life easier, you know? So there's a little bit of an education component. So that would be I really, really the difference. I really hear going. I, li I like that approach. Uh, I mean, that's that's so true. Yeah? Um, uh, and 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 when you just need to imagine um, that you're self-browsing on Amazon and you know exactly what you want. You're not browsing on Amazon. You're searching for something. And, uh, and then you know that you want this and you come there and you purchase the best one or the cheapest one or the one with the best reviews. 
and uh, and and on a store while browsing, of course, you might need to know a bit more of information. So that's really good, good guidance. Um, how do you see how do you see the role of AI um, in in the design world? So is is AI something that will help us, or is it just the output um, that 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 is delivered by a designer actually? Yeah, so I mean, AI is definitely a threat to our industry, like as designers, as copywriters. Um, and so the ways that we're using it uh, right now, for starters, it's very useful for generating hard to find stock imagery. Uh, you may know this, you may not know this, but there are certain stock images that, that just don't exist. Uh, a good example, I actually happen to have a really handy example, is we're working with a brand and they sell products exclusively for law enforcement and military personnel. Well, it's actually illegal to have stock photos of like an NYPD officer or somebody in the Marines or somebody in the Navy. And the reason it's illegal is because all their uniforms are trademarked, right? Their symbols, all that symbology on their on their uniforms is all intellectual property and you can't use it without the permission of those organizations but you can use ai to generate images of those folks and then you know like like ai does it's like the badge is a little blurry or you know it doesn't quite look exactly the same copywriting is the next part um and it's believe it or not like chat gpt is not fantastic at copywriting it's very good creatively but when you want like hard hitting, crunchy copy, it takes a little while to get to it. So we use it for idea generation, but then our copywriters are taking those ideas. It, it just helps us do what we do faster, I guess is the, is the big idea. It helps us iterate through a bunch of ideas, think in different ways, and then copy, uh, you know, then do it, go take those ideas and do it on our own. Yeah. Um, and I can completely underline that as well um <laughs> we have the same experience when we do use JetGPT. it can do a great job but it's very good at giving ideas yeah. um and the finalization still needs hands-on although i have just heard that uh elon musk said uh 2026 uh there will the ai will be more intelligent than the intelligent person on this planet or so it was just a couple of days ago i believe it you know you see how quickly like the difference between chat gpt3 and chat gpt4 was unbelievable right like it like yeah. it it's yeah. exponentially getting better and we know that right um chat, you know we've been using um we used to use mid journey to generate images yep. now you could just generate it right in chat gpt and um one of the things that it's terrible at which is our saving grace for the moment is it can't generate text very well. You know, like if you ask it to yep. make a logo, it'll misspell everything or, you know, there's no way to really put copywriting on there, but it'll get better at it, you know? And, yep. and I think that really era, you know, not just us, but everybody is going to have to kind of rethink how they do business. I don't, at least for a, for a minute where you're still going to, um, value having an advisor, right? Somebody who's done it, somebody who knows what they're doing, you can ask these AI tools to develop creative assets, but when it comes to the actual strategy and ideas behind it and that human connection, I think it's going to take a while before it gets good at that. So we've got a little bit of time on that. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, and there's one thing that you mentioned earlier today when we had our pre-chat before we started recording, and it's something that is always so, so critical and important, owning your customer. And you had some, some thoughts on that, and I would like uh, to talk about this with you a bit. So, you know, um, if you are listening to this and you're an Amazon seller, then you, um, you're probably painfully aware of what's going on with Amazon fees. They just introduced all these placement fees uh, just last week, they introduced a, a whole new fee. I can't remember what it was. Oh, uh, removal fees. Um, and so, you know, it's getting painful to sell on Amazon. In addition to that, 
Uh, now, this is anecdotal, but I feel like suspensions have been increasing as well. Now, that could just be me. I work with a lot of Amazon uh, sellers, my, my and my clients are getting suspended, you know, just for stuff that's not even their fault. Um, and so, you know, it's, you know, I find myself thinking, like, how can I help? Like, what can I do to, to be uh, a service to our customer base, who are almost all Amazon sellers? Um, and the real answer to this, whether you, you know, you don't, don't worry, don't worry with graphic rhythm or do it on your own. But the big idea is, is it's time to own your customer. That's the big idea that we really just have to use Amazon for what it was probably always should have been used for, which is traffic generation to generate traffic back to you, back to your website. And so I would really encourage you to think about how you can own your customer. And the way that we're, uh, we're helping our customers do this is by building a funnel that moves your Amazon customer out of Amazon and onto your own email list in a completely compliant way. So nothing black hat here, nothing gray hat, not, nothing even remotely risky whatsoever. It's all 100% in the books. And it's super simple. It's something that you've heard about before. It's something that you may have done, whether or not that's been effective or not, is ask them, give them an offer when they buy your product. And then they go scan the QR code, they go to the landing page, they opt in to your email list, right? That's the big idea. So now you own the customer. Now you can market to them. Now you can run special deals. If you want to, you can drive them back to Amazon. That's fine. But the point is, is you have their email address. You can talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And so that's been on my mind a lot lately. That's what I've been talking to our, my customers and clients about and helping them own, own their customer. And did you try that already with customers and how does it work? I mean, what do you offer, especially on your QR codes uh, or on, on the sheets? It's a, is it a package uh, uh, inserts that you put in that they then uh, put out and see the QR code and run into a sweepstake or um, what, what, what are your ideas behind that concept? Yeah. So. I'll preface by saying that uh, at Graphic Rhythm, we have designed hundreds and hundreds of websites for our clients. We've designed hundreds and hundreds of inserts. Like we're very, very deeply embedded in this. We've recently, only very recently though, put all of these things together into a package to build the whole funnel for you. And so we just have our very first clients going through this, uh, where, the, where it's the whole thing, like the whole package where we, we're actually in there monitoring results, tracking conversion rates, things like that. So I don't have any results to share um, where we just have our beta customers going through it. Um, however, the ideas that we're focusing on uh, is, first of all, you want an, what I call an irresistible offer, right? Uh, something that makes you the brand owner sweat. Like when I'm talking <laughs> strategy with a brand owner <laughs> and we're, we're, we're coming up with what their irresistible offer should be, I want my brand, the brand owner to be a little nervous about it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Ideally, it doesn't cost you money, but if it does cost you a little money, that's okay. All right. Um, don't ne definitely not more than a dollar, probably not more than 50 cents. We're talking like 10 to 15 cents. Think of it like a, a lead acquisition cost. Okay. So you don't want it to be too super expensive, but think about unique offers. Can I give away, um, if it's say, let's say it's a supplement, right? Can I give away the supplement they just bought? for half the price they just paid. If they go sign up, maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's something complimentary. Um, I'm working with one brand owner where they sell a product and then uh, they actually have a complimentary version of the product. It sucks, right? The complimentary thing is socks. Um, and I said, well, could you take one pair of socks out and could we sell that for $5, which is like a, you know, a 75% a discount on the price or something. And uh, he's like, oh, yeah, so that's what we're going to try over there. Um, with a supplement brand we're working with, they're going to bottle smaller portions of the supplement, so like 10 or 20 capsules in there, um, and then offer that for a very low price. If you're um, – one thing that I would say is, you know, a lot of people listening to this are probably very uh, sophisticated marketers, and they're saying to themselves, oh, this sounds like a lead magnet. Right. So some kind of ebook that you're going to give away or guide or something like that. And I would agree with you with one asterisk, which is it has to be an irresistible offer. Right. Yeah. It's not, it cannot be something that's just sounds nice. Right. So if you sell a yoga mat, uh, five, you know, a, a collection of 10 
most popular yoga positions is not going to convert because you could go to YouTube and get that. It has to be irresistible. It has to be juicy. They have to look at it and think to themselves, I would be an idiot if I didn't go scan this barcode and go do this. So there are places for this kind of thing um, where you can create an incredible guide that is just so useful. I don't have a handy example, but it should be irresistible if you decide to do a knowledge product. So just keep that in mind. Thank you so much for that um, for that tip. And I fully need to agree. I mean, whenever I get a package from Amazon and I get a lot of them, um, open it, see the cool tool that I bought and I want to have that tool. I don't care for the insides of the, of the packaging. So it needs to be also a stunning uh, insert that you really take and want to see and, 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 and want to touch it and want to work with that. So you really, it, need, it needs to be good. It cannot be just a sheet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is, I think, also, also a, a fact that, that needs to be considered. But the idea, of course, owning the customer is very, very important and, and unique. Um, I see it when I buy technical products. There it's a bit more easy because you can, of course, offer, let's say, a free guarantee or an extension of the guarantee. And for having the extension of the guarantee, you need to register. So yeah. that's something um, uh, that works for a specific kind of products very well. And I think those um, companies are already aware of that and trying to achieve this with the guarantee hack. Um, but of course, any kind of product can have, um, yeah, uh, the possibility to let the customer register for some specific kind of bonus. But I also need to agree on it needs to hurt the owner. Otherwise, it's not ir irresistible. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yep. Um, I would also say I've seen um, giving away like Amazon gift cards and things like that. Yeah. Uh, I would be really curious to see how effective they are. I personally have never, ever felt compelled to give my email address for a $5 Amazon gift card. I never have. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I would, I would try and avoid that. And one thing I would add on to when you're doing like a warranty or a guarantee kind of thing, um, I think that, you know, Amazon customers are getting more sophisticated and they know that Amazon will just give them their money back, right? Like, yeah. I don't need to sign up for this. Amazon will just give me my money back. So just um, find a way to make it more compelling. Like, hey, so, you know, so register for your warranty and get a free gift or something like that. Or, you know, something else to, to kind of compel them along. Perfectly. Thanks so much. Ian, um, it, it, it was really a pleasure. As usual, my last question of the day is, who has taught you the most about e-commerce in your career? Uh, who has taught me the most about e-commerce? Well, actually, I would probably say my mentors, uh, Dan and Dylan from The Wholesale Formula. That's where I got started was uh, doing stuff. And uh, my business was based on that, The Wholesale Formula. So those guys uh, by far have taught me the most. <laughs> for, for awesome. Sure. Thank you so much for your time. It was really a pleasure. And I really liked your concepts and ideas around graphic design, actually, that it isn't just design or the thing that is the final outcome, you know, the things we see, but also the, the strategy behind that. So to really tell the, to tell a story to the people seeing the designs, to really give them the informations that they need to make the purchase in a series of design elements that you're using step-by-step step in the gallery of Amazon, step-by-step step in the A-plus content, and, and also having different imagery and different design concepts on website for explaining um, and on, on Amazon or marketplaces in general for convincing. And um, there are so many things to learn. Thank you so much. And uh, good luck with your own your customer strategy. Thank you so much. And that's it for this episode of the Ecom Ops Podcast. If you enjoyed listening and would like us to find and interview more e-commerce operations experts, please search for Ecom Ops Podcast in your favorite podcast listening app and then subscribe, rate, and review. Until next time. <laughs>